Good afternoon everyone and welcome to this year's annual KVH and Zespri Joint Nursery Forum. Thanks to our presenters who are here to share their ex expertise and experience with us today. For those that have joined us for Biosecurity Day, I hope you gain some uh, relevant understanding about our biosecurity landscape. Just for some housekeeping, um, if there's a fire, we'll go through the main doors of this room, out through the main um, church building, and then we'll meet by the volleyball court. If you're moving around the foyer, please wear your mask. And if you're looking for a bathroom, when you head out these doors, go left down to the end of the foyer and then left again down the hallway. So this afternoon, we've got a series of presentations from KVH and Zespri and guest speakers focusing on aspects of the kiwifruit industry supply chain. We'll have a short break between KVH and Zespri. We encourage you to ask questions as you go. So first up today, we have uh, Kerry O'Neill, who's our Monitoring and Compliance Advisor from KVH. So Kerry's been with KVH for nine months now, and she's taken over from Karen Lowry. Kerry works closely with nurseries to help achieve the requirements of the pathway plan and works with other plant material pathways to manage biosecurity risk within the industry. So this afternoon, Kerry will be providing us an update on the KPCS standard. Thanks, Kerry. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming to our nursery forum. And I know that some of you guys were here for the biosecurity day this morning, so glad you could stick around. Um, so I'm just going to talk to a few of the nursery stats from the last 12 months and what's kind of popped up through the audit reports that have come through. So just kind of taking a look at what our nursery numbers have been since the KPCS started in 2016. And from around 2019, we can see that the nursery numbers have stayed pretty level. Um, there's been a bit of a shift between the full suit nurseries and the restric restricted nurseries, just based on um, PSA outcomes and also the um, switch to Red 19 in a lot of the nurseries as well. So this year we're looking at about 54 nurseries across the board. And what's come up in the audit, so just a few reminders for what you guys are doing when you're out in your nurseries. Um, I know a lot of you already have the nursery KVH signs at your entrances. Um, they might be a bit faded or looking a bit worse for wear, so you're welcome to contact me and I can send some out to you. Um, it is a requirement of the pathway plan that you have notification at the entrance of your nursery, and these signs are a really great way just to tick that box and make sure you're meeting those requirements as well. So this year we seem to have had quite an influx in home gardener requests, which we have a few nurseries who are really great at supplying plants to those home gardeners. Um, these Plants do need to come from full cert nurseries because we can't have any um, PSA risk pathways moving to home gardeners. Um, that would just be a bit of a nightmare to try and manage, obviously. So if you are a full cert nursery and you do have some plants available and you're happy to supply home gardeners, then that would be wonderful. You could get in touch with me and I can um, point you in, in contact with those home gardeners as well. One of the common themes throughout the audits this year that we've picked up on is just the supplier documentation for all the incoming plant material into your nursery. So whether this is your seeds from your mother plants, your budwood, your compost, um, if you can keep all those records together for your KPCS audit, we do have a really great template at the back end of the nursery manual that you can use. Um, and also you can just staple your invoices or whatever they give you along with it and then that just makes it really easy when AQ come along. Um, uh, ooh, sorry, too fast. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the nurseries for the smooth transition from moving from the KVH sampling of all your leaf testing for you guys doing it yourself. It's been a really great success and um, we really appreciate it. It takes a lot of the load off us. The, um, I'd just like to remind you guys that when you are doing your leaf sampling, if 
the, the earlier you do it, the better, because the hills do need viable leaves to be able to do the testing that's required, and also to take your samples when it's nice and dry so we don't have leaves getting wet. Um, they deteriorate quite quickly on their way to the laboratory, so just a couple of points there. Um, and lastly, just if you do receive any non-compliance for your audit, just to get it, get it completed within the time frame that, that's given to you, which is 30 days. Um, if, if it goes over that 30 days, then you can be at risk of losing your cert certification and then not being able to move those plants, which nobody wants. So the updates to the KPCS this year is Obviously, we have the pathway plan that was implemented on the 1st of April. Um, a lot of you will already be using the most up-to-date version of the manual, which is the 6.0, and all the requirements of the pathway plan are met in this manual. Um, specifically for KPCS nurseries, this includes shelter plants. Um, Linda will speak with us to this a bit later with a great case study. Um, but essentially the shelter plants create quite a significant risk pathway. Um, when you're moving them around, they can contract pests and diseases that then go onto orchards. So for nurseries that already have shelter belt trees and are KPCS certified, these, um, all your requirements, requirements are met under the pathway plan. Um, for nurseries with no kiwi fruit plants um, who are just providing shelter trees, they can meet these requirements through a different pathway, um, and the easiest way through that is through the plant pass certification scheme. So lastly, I'd just like to talk to you guys a bit about the KPCS and the plant pass equivalents. So KVH and NZPPI have been working quite closely to align both of these certification schemes so that if you are a producer of multiple crops, then you are able to go through one of the schemes and have recognition or equivalence um, under certain pathways. So the KPCS is a kiwifruit specific scheme, um, which you will all know as you're all KPCS nurseries. Um, so this has been going since 2016. If you grow other, if you're a majority kiwi fruit grower with other crops, you can gain plant pass certification through the KPCS manual. Um, there are not as many requirements as you need to meet for your KPCS. So for other species or other crops, you don't need to do annual testing. Um, and there are not as many monitoring requirements, but those pathways still can be met and you can gain that certification through the KPCS. We do have Karen Scott from NZPPI presenting a little bit later on, and she will talk more about the plant pass certification pathway. Um, but in terms of the equivalence, if you are a nursery who has a minority amount of kiwi fruit plants, you can go through the plant pass pathway. Um, instead of going through the KPCS, you just have an additional module that you tag on to your plant pass manual course standard, um, and the auditing process includes that module, um, so you can gain certification and meet the pathway plan requirements through the plant pass certification scheme. Wonderful. That's all from me. Thanks. Thanks for your update on the KPC Curie and um, the pathway plan. It segues really closely into my update on the pathway plan, so it's fantastic. So I'm here to provide you an update on um, KVH's new pathway plan today, um, which as Kerry mentioned has been implemented since the 1st of April this year. So the pathway plan um, has been um, put in place to basically take over the National PSAV Management Plan, which was in place since 2013. 
So the um, PSA and PNP was very successful in managing the impact and spread of PSA, um, but it does expire next year. So while the um, NPNP focused on just one pest, so managing PSA, KVH does work in much broader environment trying to manage wider biosecurity risk. So with this, um, KVH spent a couple of years developing the National Pathway Management Plan to manage risk across kiwifruit pathways. Um, the plan keeps things simple and practical to make sure there is an additional compliance on growers. Um, there's very little change from the current NPNP except to increase the ability to, to respond to wider threats to the kiwifruit industry, including um, growers, nurseries, post-harvest, contractors and others. Um, the plan is also fiscally neutral, which means it doesn't cost growers anything additional. So what are the objectives of the plan? Um, so the proposed plan was um, put in place to, to detect biosecurity threats early, so to reduce the impact and spread to the industry. So it's being the ambulance at the top of the cliff as opposed to the bottom of the cliff. It's to ensure that we can trace threats easily as well, so we know where plant material and other risk items are moving around the industry, and we can trace them quickly in a biosecurity response. And it's also to improve our general understanding of kiwifruit industry risks and how they can be managed cost effectively. So there is an additional cost on growers, nurseries, contractors or post harvest. So the pathway plan manages risks across kiwifruit industry pathways, including plant material, organic matter inputs and people and equipment to ensure that risk isn't introduced to an orchard or any other sites. So nurseries, contractors, post harvest companies and others are covered by the plan, as I mentioned. For nurseries, this includes biosecurity risk management for movements of budwood, pollen, mature plants and now shelter plants under KPCS. For growers, it just means sourcing material only from uh, nurseries that have got the KPCS logo and to keep traceability information to be confident that they're meeting the pathway plan requirements. Compost is also included under the framework of the pathway plan, but we don't have compost under the KPCS standard. While we would like to see a standard in this area, it's not KVH's role to lead this. And contractors is, are another focus area of the pathway plan to make sure that they have a biosecurity plan in place and they're not introducing risks to other sites within the industry. So as a reminder, um, I'll provide a quick overview of the scheme and what it includes. So make sure you register with KVH, maintain good traceability records, use good hygiene practices, monitor for biosecurity threats throughout the season, use safe growing material, safe plant inputs, test for PSA and any variants, and practice crop protection. So pretty simple. So what does this mean for you? The new KPS standard, or the new version of it, was rolled out at the beginning of the year and most nurseries are already uh, meeting the requirements of the new pathway plan. If you're a nursery that's just selling kiwifruit plants or moving mature plants, there's no significant changes. If you're a KPCS nursery selling kiwifruit and shelter plants, shelter plants are now included in the new standard. Non-KPCS nurseries, as Kerry mentioned, um, can sell shelter plants to kiwifruit orchards, but they need to make it meet an equivalent level of certification to the KPCS, which can be done under Plant Pass, which Karen from NZPPI will talk about later. So the key changes for those providing shelter belt plants under the KPCS to demonstrate that the pathway plan um, will cover this risk. So feedback that we got um, during during consultation of the pathway plan was to keep things simple and practical so that we can del deliver solutions to assist in managing robust biosecurity. The two examples here are provided um, are the biosecurity online template um, and the on-site traceability tool. So the bi biosecurity online template allows you to fill in your biosecurity plan um, by going onto the online portal instead of filling out your old paper version. While the traceability app allows you to move um, plant material and keep track of it using an app rather than a paper form of recording your movements. 
Um, you may have seen recently in KBH's communications that we've detected a variant of PSA. Um, this, is, this information is important to um, nurseries as well um, as it impacts your testing um, for PSA and demonstrates why it's in place. So KVH regularly monitors for variants of PSA um, and we do this through um, monitoring for unusual symptoms on orchard, um, which is a process that Linda leads, as well as looking at genetic variations of samples that we collect. So during the season we um, collect samples to look for copper and bactericide resistance and we keep these isolates to do further genetic reviews of. It's during these genetic reviews that we picked up the variant, which is a single deletion, deletion of a gene. So what this means now is that we're undertaking research to understand the significance of this variant and looking at doing spring monitoring to determine whether the variant is still present on orchards um, and whether it's spread any further. As a precautionary um, action, we've taken the the approach of managing risk um, by moving, by restricting the movement of plant material off these orchards. Um, and under the pathway plan, we have the ability to do this because PSA remains a specified organism. Yeah. I think that's me. Thank you. <laughs> I've got a different version of the presentation. <laughs> So our next speaker today is Linda Peacock, who is an industry liaison and technical specialist. Linda brings to KVH a great deal of knowledge, having worked in the kiwifruit industry for 30 years, both in growing and post-harvest roles. Linda has a significant involvement in the relationship between KVH and industry, and runs the unusual, sim unusual symptoms reporting on orchards, which is what Linda's going to present on today. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Leanne. Don't panic everyone who was here this morning. I'm not going to do exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, so, first of all, welcome. It's great to catch up with you nursery people. I used to um, manage to get to a few of your sites when I was working with, Kerry, uh, with sorry, Karen. Um, and now that you're collecting your own samples, there's not too much need for us to come and visit you, but we'd, more than, we'd be more than happy to keep our um, relationship of wandering through your gateways every now and then. Um, so today we just want to have a quick talk about um, the reporting of unusual symptoms across the industry and as, we, as I um, talked about this morning, our biosecurity system kind of goes two ways. It goes up through our MPI system into the scientists and the diagnostics and there's always a lot of focus and interest on that. But um, just that remembrance that, that none of those, if, if samples never come forward, then there's never the opportunity to look at anything or learn anything, or take us forward. So I just want to um, you know, reiterate just how important it is for us as an industry that we have that connectivity with the growers and also the nurseries um, regarding the sorts of things that you're seeing in your nurseries. Um, nursery men are generally, and women, are generally very competent in that pest and disease space. Um, but you know, just bear in mind that um, there's a lot of tools and help available you know, if, if you do find something challenging going on in your nursery, so please give us a call. So the reason we run um, the unusual symptoms process is effectively our general, a bit of a general surveillance system um, for our industry. The reporting of unusual symptoms gives, gives us the best chance of in, um, identifying things that might be new or emerging, and we do know that um, pathogens, well, um, novel organisms can arise it's also um, sometimes we find new associations between organisms with kiwi fruit. Um, we're moving into different kind of climatic conditions and we're moving into different growing areas. We're moving into some of our plantings going over land which was previously used for other crops. So, you know, chances are that going forward we might see things uh, changing a little bit differently. We've also got different varieties including, you know, new males coming into the um, into the process, um, the likes of our red and going forward. And there's often nuances in what happens to those um, different varieties out in the environment. So it's imp important that we can um, keep up with that and pass on that knowledge to the industry. Um, sometimes we can always also have organisms that we're used to living with, but then they just start 
presenting a little bit differently. Um, and this morning we had a talk which included Rob um, making comment about um, Neonectra microkinidae, which we found down the South Island starting to behave a little bit differently on the Gold 3 than what it had previously done on Hayward. So it just rose the importance of finding out a little bit more um, knowledge about that. So in terms of industry reporting, we're really pleased to be able to say that um, the number of reports that we receive each year go up. It means my workload goes up a little bit, but <laughs> um, that's good for me. <laughs> um, last year we got 56 reports from the industry. Um, so some of the things that come through relate to spray damage or environmental or nutritional challenges, but amongst ones we had last year, there were actually 42 um, that did relate to organisms. So that just shows um, we are getting a good level of reporting. So the, the benefit of um, the diagnostics is that it actually identifies the actual cause of the problem. You know, um, sometimes we think we know what's going on, but it's always good to have, I guess, like going to the doctor and finding out what's really going on or not. <laughs> and it just gives us awareness um, that uh, if there is something that's not right with um, plants that we can avoid the chances of it might spread further. In terms of the process, um, really simple. You just give Kerry a call <laughs> or you um, send it through to info at KVH or give us a call if you've got something going on. So um, we just gather some more information from you. Um, what are you seeing? How long have you been seeing it? Um, what are your thoughts on what's going on there? Um, request some photos from you. Um, and the reason that we ask for that sort of detailed inform background information is when we then turn and uh, work with the labs, or talk to the labs about what sort of sampling would work for whatever's being seen, um, we just get the best sample going forward. So then we determine do we need to um, visit the nursery. Um, quite often you guys will just bundle up a sample and we can um, get that sent away for you. And it can either go to the Hills lab. Hills, of course, have been our long-term diagnostics around PSA. Um, it's, we, we've also got an open door with um, MPI, Plant Health Environmental Lab, they're more than happy to help us with things that are a little bit, um, making us a little bit quizzical. And then we've also got an opportunity to send plant material, if it makes sense to do that, down to Plant Diagnostics in Christchurch. But of course that requires um, a permission from KVH because it's a movement of plant material from North Island to South Island. But really the MPI lab is probably our um, go-to in terms of unusual symptoms. So um, we arrange for those sample collection and make contact with the lab, and then as the results come through, um, we just bring those results back to you. Um, Leanne quickly mentioned the fact that we've now moved to this pathway plan, and I think for you guys in the nursery industry that have been doing a fantastic job with all your processes, um, over the years, I think that growers will actually gain more awareness of the value of what that KPCS certification means. Um, they're really knowing that when they're doing their gap audits, they're, they're looking to, to have that um, proof that they're using the right plants, that they're using the right budwood, that they're using the right shelter plants. Um, so I think that you know there will be a heightened awareness of the role that you guys do um, and a recognition of the value that that adds um, for our industry which I think that's really good to see. Um, when we do talk and introduce the pathway plan to growers, and of course the pathway plan is really an extension out beyond the thinking of PSA to more biosecurity risks, um, we remind them of why we're moving in this direction. So the example of the spread of Ceratocystis fimbriata in Brazil um, is used we bring that up in the pathway discussions um, to provide an, of an answer, of an example of an organism that actually evolved from a native pathogen um, in Brazil. So, I mean, it shows an example that it can happen, and if it can happen once, it can happen again, and it could happen here at some stage. So, on that kind of case study, what happened is that the um, native pathogen was then distributed from the original site through a budwood movement um, into some into nurseries, and from that nurseries, it widely distributed across the growing area. Um, the challenge with that disease is that um, ended up with a, a roughly 50% um, vine loss for the industry, and at the end of the day, kiwi fruit was no longer viable. There were no tolerant cultivars. There were no effective agrochemical controls. 
And of course, that's why we're always looking outside of our own borders to understand these kinds of threats. So the, the checks and balances of the KPCS that we've got in place and you guys work at on a daily basis, um, they reduce the risk of this kind of scenario occurring here. Um, success in avoiding this sort of thing happen, happening to our industry is dependent on all of our awareness, good monitoring and reporting what's being seen down the chain. Our shelter species have now been pulled into the KPCS scheme, which is great. And um, it was interesting, this, lead, this case study here is just regarding a call that came uh, in from a, an orchard manager who was involved in a lot of um, development orchards. And he was a little bit um, interested in the fact that um, back in 2019, he saw quite a number of his um, cryptomeria shelter were showing um, some symptoms in dieback. Dieback in itself can often be attributed to lack of water or irrigation, but these were quite established trees. So he was a little bit quizzical that some of his two metre trees were affected. Um, so the follow he didn't make any contact that year, but the following year, 2020, he noted that he had um, more plants with symptoms, and that was including on two other of his sites. There was no obvious difference in the planting regime that he'd been following. Uh, Fertiliser irrigation was exactly the same. Um, so then it came back to, I uh, didn't really understand what was going on. And that's typical, you know, we try to work through our own scope of knowledge. And then we decided that we would take a sample and send it away to Plant Diagnostics in Christchurch. Um, with the results indicating that there was a complex of um, organisms present along the, that shelter area. Um, and it was thought that the two Phytophthora species that were associated with those trees with the dieback were probably causal. The challenge is, of course, of, is um, Phytophthora isn't particularly friendly with our kiwi fruit either, so that just lifted his awareness that there is that ability to track a disease which comes into the orchard or um, becomes more prevalent in an orchard the movement of people backwards and forwards and machinery backwards and forwards um, can also spread it. So um, the recommendation was that um, those trees be cut, cut back and the worst affected ones taken out, but with um, the surety that plant material was um, buried and you know, moved away from the site so he didn't get infect the uh, further infections. And also in the stems of the trees, it was found that there was um, a, a conifer canker there as well, and it was recommended that that get, that get trimmed back and then a copper applied. So asking the lab the question, so if we had a shelter trimmer running through this um, boundary shelter, was there the possibility that that could spread along the shelter? And yes, um, it was indicated that it was. So again, that raises the awareness of why um, our pathway plan also involves discussions and building awareness with contractors that indeed in some cases they can inadvertently be transfer um, mechanisms. Um, so we got another um, case study as well um, towards the end of last year and this was from a site uh, with young kiwi fruit plants, bare rooted plants. Um, and the plants looked very healthy when they came to be um, pulled up for, ready for dispatch, despite there being quite a lot of high um, autumn rainfall, and there was a little bit of water pooling ab across a little bit of the growing area. Um, the plants themselves, uh, when, you know, just as you walked up the row and looked at them, they looked absolutely fine, um, but when the plants were lifted, um, the grower man had, uh, noticed that there was quite a number of red roots and a lot of blackening of roots um, down in the lower part of the plants. So that was um, reasonably unusual. And so again, samples were sent away and DNA sequencing confirmed the presence of, again, Phytophthora. So the value of that is that became like a stop, stop go point for those plants. They um, didn't travel and therefore they didn't risk the transfer of disease to another area. Um, it also gave the grower an opportunity to consider what might happen on that site next. So all those um, affected plants were disposed of and actually shifted from that growing area because he didn't want to um, risk the chance that there'd be a reinfection in the following year. So um, that's a very 
uh, example of the value of getting the diagnostics done and the end of reporting. So this is talking to you about something you already uh, very dear to your heart, I'm sure. Um, so monitoring is an essential component of the um, KPCS scheme um, because absence of disease is actually just as valuable as presence because if something does turn up and you need to go back and decide when, that, when did that turn up, if you've got a nice page of filled out records, um, you've got a lot of confidence that, of when it might have turned up. If you've got a, a lot of blank sheets, um, you're not so sure. So just um, a reminder to keep doing all those good things that you do and you know, run a bit of a risk assess assessment across your site to work out where um, the higher risk areas might be and pay a little bit more attention to those areas. And then lastly, um, another really important component of the new pathway plan is the importance of traceability. Um, again, uh, you guys have been working in the space with your traceability forward and back from your mother plants. Um, your budwood coming into your nursery, your plants going where they go, um, and providing good batch records for um, growers. So I just want to um, make you aware that this year, in fact, when we were following up two unusual symptoms reports um, in the industry, uh, we actually called on the traceback through to the nursery records. So. One of the sites that gave us a call was um, a site where there was a really poor graft success rate. The grower had invested um, a small fortune on buying gold licence um, and put up a new, new development, all the shelter and everything that goes with it, and, what, and in fact only was achieving something like a 50% um, graft take. So when you're in a situation where you've got a lot of money out and you've got a 50% graft take, you kind of want to know uh, what was the cause of that? So, two options there, budwood, maybe, nursery plants, maybe. So what we were able to do is, um, the budwood had been supplied through the Zespri system, and um, we, within, well, I think it was about four hours, Rob, I think you got that uh, information back to us of where that batch came from. Um, from we, we could trace the budwood to the exact block to the exact person that had um, batched it up. Um, we knew when it had left the property, we knew when it had arrived at Zestry, we knew when it went in the call store, when it came out of the call store, who, who picked it up, the day they picked it up, and so that provided a really good trace back to the block. There were monitoring records to indicate that the Budwood block had done the um, due diligence at that end, and um, because that Budwood had also moved out to two other properties. We were able to follow that and identify how well had the graft take gone on those orchards, and they were absolutely fine. So that didn't seem to ind indicate that the budwood was a problem. So of course, then the next problem comes to, okay, so is it from the nursery? So again, um, because the dispatch records have been all well filled out, we knew exactly the batches that it came from, went back to the nursery, uh, went back through they went back through their records, and again, um, plants from that batch, of, same batch, had gone out to a number of receivers, and again, going around those um, particular sites, they similarly had, um, the plants were growing well, and the um, graft take was good. So that seemed to rule out both the budwood and the nursery um, plant side of things. So returning to the site, there was a, a bit of a discussion about, okay, so what might what else might be going on, and then some of the things that might not have been top of mind started coming forward. Uh, the plants that did go in the ground probably went in too late. Um, they weren't, and they suffered a quite significant drought stress. Uh, the, the shelter on the site didn't quite go up in time, and they had um, a lot colder conditions through the spring than that, what they'd recognised. So it was actually environmental conditions which had caused a bit of the problem. Um, and on top of that, some of the plants had not really been planted particularly well. So um, that just all added up to, OK, well, there's things that we could do better. Um, let's give it another go next year. Um, but that was really pleasing to be able to see that both of that, that trace back was available really quickly um, and that gave confidence um, for that grower that, OK, I've got to look elsewhere for what might be going on. Um, the pro the um, picture that we got down the bottom of that slide there, um, as a result of Bovis, I think you know, New Zealand in general learnt a lot about 
just how connected our animal industry was. Um, when you get something that can spread by the movement of animals and in a, a climate where supposedly we've got it, there's a tracking system in place and everyone's doing the tracking um, and Bovis proved that actually there were gaps in, in that system. Um, and it also, this illustrates the number of movements that were occurring between the North Island and the South Island animal movements over the course of a week. So you can see that um, when we think we're quite far away from people, we're actually really, really close by the connectivity of our movements, our pathways. So similar, I think, as we build our on our on-site apps that gets taken up and people start um, logging where their plant movements are going, where people are moving. I think that similarly we will see that the kiwi fruit industry is, is no different from this. Plants can't move, but people can certainly move them around. And so all the work that you guys do on your sites and our um, building the recognition of the importance of those traceability that you guys maintain out into orchard sites are going to keep us in really good stead as we go forward. Of course, a lot of organisms can remain quite um, asymptomatic for two or three years. So over time, that ability to be able to move back through the traceability records is really important. So um, it's embedded as a cornerstone for you guys, but I think that you should be quite happy that um, the rest of the industry is kind of hopefully coming into that space as well, so that together our systems will be you know, a lot stronger. So um, just in summary, um, doing a good job. <laughs> Keep doing a good job, and um, as I say, at the other end, we're working to help, um, you know, the budwood suppliers, um, shelter species suppliers, um, also work with that diligence around traceability um, as well, so build a stronger industry. If you do see something that's unusual, just remember the diagnostic capacity that we've got effectively behind us as an industry to help us work out what might be going on and be steps forward if you do find anything unusual. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Linda. Another great reminder to report the unusual. Um, and as I mentioned this morning, um, please call the 0800 number of KVH or call Linda or Kerry. Um, so our next presenter is Karen Scott from um, the plant New Zealand Plant Producers Incorporated, uh, who is the Plant Pass Programs Manager. Um, Karen has recently joined the NZPPI team and has a passion for championing industry growth. So Karen manages the NZPPI programs, supporting the development, implementation and delivery of programs like Plant Pass to meet NZPPI's vision of a thriving plant production industry. So Karen's joining us online. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, apologies for not being there in person, but thank you for um, accepting me in a virtual world. Um, as mentioned, I've just joined NZPPI recently as the program manager, and I'm excited to share an update on Plant Pass with you. I'll just uh, share my screen there. Uh, so a bit of insight um, or background uh, for some of you. Um, plant Pass is our voluntary certification scheme for plant producers recognising good biosecurity practice. It gives producers and those that purchase their plants greater confidence and um, that they will be free of um, unwanted pests. Um, it's a system to strengthen biosecurity risk within nurseries. Um, benefits um, of plant, plant, uh, plant pass include increasing nursery risk management, protecting producers and enabling safe movement of plants, uh, reduces likelihood of a high risk event occurring. And uh, I understand there was quite a 
bit of background um, over the past few years um, in this process, um, but we're pleased to launch this in May uh, this year, 2022. I'm just going to play a short video um, that we used for the launch um, and has been promoted on a number of uh, social media sites. It all begins here. It all begins with you. It all begins with Plant Pass. Plant Pass certification means biosecurity for nurseries, growers, and more. It's a commitment to practices that protect our industries, finding and eliminating hazards before they spread. You're proud of the work you do, the plants you grow, and the land you restore. Protecting what we love and what we do starts with good biosecurity. With Plant Pass, your customers have the confidence that what you sell is healthy and safe. Together, we can protect Aotearoa, the crops we grow and the plants we love. Plant Pass, register now at www.plantpass.org.nz. Um, so that's our promotional video that you may or may not have seen um, doing the rounds. Um, so Plant Pass uh, was established as an operational agreement um, under the GIA, the Government Industry Agreement for Biosecurity Readiness and Response Framework. Uh, the operational agreement's been agreed and signed by key stakeholders in the primary sector. Uh, NZPPI is the scheme manager and we deliver the program for the operational partnership. Um, in uh, conjunction with the certification that's obtained, uh, there are signatories to the Plant Buyers Accord that's been established. And the Plant Buyers Accord uh, organisations or retailers that are committed to influencing and encouraging plant producers to register and achieve certification to the scheme. Uh, work began in late uh, 2017 with support and funding has come through from MPI, councils, forestry, horticulture, uh, viticulture to help establish the scheme. Um, but in sort of 2018, 2020, I believe, uh, most of the work was established with plant producers uh, to design, pilot and refine the plant pass standards guidance and systems. So Plant Pass is a single system uh, that recognises and manages the complexity and diversity among a variety of plant producers, and it provides a framework for end-to-end -end risk management from nursery inputs, production to plant buyers and their unique environments. It increases plant producer responsiveness to pest threats before nursery stock is distributed. Um, as you can see, we've got the seed scheme structure up there. So we've got the core generic standard and checklist, and then specific modules as or if required. Um, we go through the process in six steps. Um, we do run workshops if people are interested to provide this information. And then the first step we consider is a registration um, that you're on board with the scheme and you work through the self-assessment checklist. Um, we start this at the workshop if you want some assistance and then you go away into the workplace to work through the self-assessment and if necessary, system improvement. Uh, we work with Assure Quality to actually conduct, or we don't work with it, they conduct the audit um, for the process. Um, and then you'll go back with corrective actions if necessary, resulting in certification. As Kerry mentioned, um, there is equivalency um, that's available um, between the schemes. Um, so if you have a look on the website, you'll recognise um, all of these plant pass ones currently up there with the core standards. So they're free to look at, the checklists are all online. 
so you can have a look at um, hopefully the simplicity of it um, and also how it may work with the equivalency of your schemes. If you've got questions around the equivalency, um, feel free to approach Kerry or myself. Uh, we are just currently building some more modules um, due to interest and demand and discussions with industry. Um, just an update um, on the work to date, um, since this has been launched in May. Um, we have run 12 workshops across 12 different regions. Um, of the 12 workshops, we had attendees from 101 entities. And of the 101 entities, um, we're really pleased to have had 64 engaged in the scheme process. Um, this exceeded our annual goal already, um, so we're really pleased with this uptake. And we've got a mix across the industry. Um, 95 uh, yeah, 95% of those engaged are all producers um, and attendees. Um, we've had a few across the councils. We've just had Wellington Council um, keen to join on board as well. Um, we're really pleased and hoping that you know this scheme will encourage other nurseries to also improve their practice as word of mouth um, is getting shared around and we're um, fielding a lot more inquiries about additional knowledge and workshop and how we can help in the process. Um, our next focus um, we'll be looking at building group scheme protocols for those minorities and how we can work together um, and give them the strength to also gain certification. Uh, just up on the left of the slide we just um, pulled some stats. We ran our media campaign uh, through one day video um, and we were really pleased to see the uptake, we had uh, over 280,000 views of the video that you just watched earlier. And a lot of our registrations and traffic have been coming through um, Facebook, Instagram, or um, via our newsletters that we directly send out. Uh, so for our, our next steps, our work in progress, we are working with industry to maintain and update resources and standards. Uh, we've just updated, um, doesn't affect murderous, <laughs> murderous uh, modules, um, and um, you can see we've got a variety um, coming ahead that will keep us busy um, and updating as we hear um, on requests for modules to add in. Um, we've also um, had requests for more workshops this year. We were, thought we were only going to do 12, but we've just um, this week uploaded dates for three more workshops around Plant Pass, um, one in Auckland, Whangarei and Christchurch. Um, if there's any specific workplaces um, that want one, we can also approach and we're happy to go in and give some one-on-one -on -one support um, as required. Um, so, so final slide, just to summarise um, why and why we're doing Plant Pass and how we're here to help to provide a framework to recognise, support and improve current biosecurity and risk management practices and to provide assurance uh, that plants have been raised in conditions that minimise the likelihood of the spread of plant pests for plant buyers. Thank you. Oh, um, hand it back to the floor. Thanks for your update, Karen, on Plant Pass, um, as well as current and future opportunities um, for the scheme. Um, so we have some time for questions now, if anyone would like to um, ask anything. No? OK. So with that, um, we're going to take a short 10 minute break and then we're going to hand over to Zespri um, for the afternoon's presentations. Thank you. OK, we'll kick it off. Well, welcome uh, on behalf of Zespri to uh, the Nursery Forum. Thank you very much for coming along. It's, um, it's been a while since I've seen a few of you face to face. COVID, various other things, too much work. Uh, so it's good to see you. Good to see um, a representative from the South Island as well, in person. So lovely to see you, Kate. 
And welcome to those online as well. I'm glad you could join us. The other thing is that the auto validation system. I haven't been. I haven't been getting around. I haven't been talking to people on the phone. What's this all about? So it's yeah. It's good to catch up with people. We're very fortunate to have uh, Julie Onsorge with us from KBC, who's our guest speaker today. So really looking forward to her presentation about what's happening in that uh, breeding space. So our agenda for the afternoon is. Um, myself up first with a few stats and things around what's happening in the nursery space. Um, Kiwi Fruit Breeding Centre with Julia. She'll be she is the Kiwi Fruit Evaluation Operations Team Leader, so heavily involved in the new varieties that have just been released for um, into trial. Tracy McCarthy, who's our Zespri Head of Grower Commercial Services, will get a, a bit of an idea of what's happening with the licence review. Um, we're all reasonably familiar, I think, what happened with the licence release this year. It was reduced down to from what it previously was, but Tracy will run through that. And then Rob will give us a bit of a rundown on the Budwood and just what's happening in the Budwood space as well. Rob and I, has everybody met Rob? Does everyone know Rob? Rob St Ledger. We had the, uh, the privilege of distributing the new varieties this year, which was pretty exciting, so um, yeah, it's good, good to see what's going to happen with those. So a few stats, there's currently 36 nurseries that have got a propagation facility agreement. Now the, I'm calling them active and non-active, there's only 25 nurseries that are currently transacting grafted licensed plant material. So there was, it was more than that last year, there was nearly uh, over 30, there was 32 or 33. So there's about 11 non-active. They're keeping their current agreements, but they're not actively grafting over. They're just doing a bit of rootstock or just having a year off. There's a couple of potentials who have come to us this year wanting to become nurseries, but nothing's come from it, so they haven't got agreements yet. And there's four have terminated. That's not the nurseryman or woman that's been terminated. That's their agreement. So we've, they've, um, they've pulled out of the program, so no longer involved. So the nurseries by region, we have 13 in the Bay of Plenty in Coromandel, which that extends from Coromandel all the way to Takaha. Uh, three in Gisborne that are active, two in Nelson, four in the Waikato, two in Northland and Auckland, and that includes Ashley from up on the west coast, and one in Southland, Fiordland Nursery right down in Southland. And just on Southland, we utilised Southland at the Fiordland Nurseries and Zelandia Nurseries with the Red 19 introduction into Nelson, into the, North, into the South Island this year. They went through the KVH uh, tissue culture pathway and they then went into uh, plant and food. They got bulked up and we were able to distribute the Red 19 into the South Island this year. It's all grafted, it's all ready to go. So that was pretty exciting. If you're baffled by this, so am I. Um, this is, this is the effect of using the new auto validation system. We can pull data now out for the entire nursery submissions that have been made into it. Plus we can also individualise it by nursery apparently. So I'm hoping that down the track when we get through uh, the season a bit, I'll be able to individualise a little dashboard like this that you can have if you're interested in getting one of these. It's just a bit of a few stats and a bit of data around things. So on your, be your, that side, on the right there, we've got the total request. Now you can see that most of the requests that have come through have been for, um, for gold, which doesn't necessarily mean there's more, lots of gold going out. It just means that some of the red, there's been a lot more red go out. You can see on that, on the left-hand side there, um, second in from the end, there's actually been 102,000 red plants transacted and there's been 153,000 gold plants transacted. So the, the red sales this year have been a lot larger. There's been some big orders going out. Request by reason, you can see there replacement and <coughs> development, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's lots of replacements. It's just the number of requests that are coming through. So there's a significant amount more of, of uh, replacement orders coming through. Um, the, on the, your far left there, the approved by reason is the, you can see their development has been quite large. There's still very small amounts of replacements going out at the moment. 
maybe that'll change further down in the season, I'm not sure, but there's been some reasonable numbers going out for development. And also the one on your right there at the bottom just gives you a bit of an idea of when the actual sales commence. You can see it's just really starting to spike up now as we go into August, sort of July it started to really pick up, so the um, submissions, that's when our submissions have come through. How are you finding the system? Is it working all right? I'm interested to know. It's not easy enough to use? Yep. So when you get a bounce back to say that it's stuck in the system or it's being, it's pending, the, the reasons are it'll be declined, and you can see the reasons there, the incorrect CAPIN. Um, it'll ping up and send an, an email to me to say there's something stuck in the system. It's mostly in, incorrect CAPIN. So I'll get back to you and I'll get the CAPIN updated, decline that one, resubmit it, and it'll either be your auto or manual approved. Incorrect submission, so it was someone's, it was, they didn't actually have any license on that CAPIN, so it was declined. Um, what's it say, insufficient license, so it was something that they just couldn't take the amount of plants that were ordered, so we declined those and got a resubmission, and just some others, which is me just doing some testing. So the manually approved ones, uh, most of it was because people had already submitted a, that CAPIN previously. So if it comes through with that CAPIN, you'll find you'll get an email back to say it's been reviewed, and that's normally because it's um, had a CAPIN submitted previously, so I just go sh through and make sure they've got enough license. Then we've also got, can't even read it from down here, um, incorrect reason. So that's just something that just doesn't make sense. So I'd have to go and ring up. The, um, the system doesn't recognise unusual comments or it's missed out a big chunk of it, so they, it'll just ping up to me. Um, so we've got some double planting, incorrect capon, I don't know why that's in there, that should have been declined, and some replanting. So often people are doing some double planting, so they've, they've actually exceeded the amount of plants that they'd normally have in that, on a hectare, but they're doing double planting, so we get the reason, we record that reason in our system. So this is a, um, a map of where the requests have gone to. Um, you can see there that the gold has gone predominantly to the Bay of Plenty and up in, but up in Northland. There's been some huge sales into, of the red going into, um, into Hamilton, into the Waikato area, smaller down country, nothing into Napier. So it's quite an interesting stats there and the location of the approved request by location. So this is the CAPIN, this is taking the information from where the CAPIN's located, so again, predominantly into the Bay of Plenty, Coromandel, and to Northland. So any comments or questions? I mean, at the moment, we've had 255,787 plants have been come through the system and transacted. Is that what the sort of numbers you're thinking? I don't know, the, last year I think we did about 350, 360,000, so there's still a bit of time to go. Any comments on that? Any questions around those stats? No. So this is the audits um, results from last year. I'll be doing another round of very small audits. Uh, we're not combining them with KVH audits yet because we're just trying to keep them separate to get some more information. Um, and you can see here the main reason for the, the non-compliances this year was around the, so the PVRs not on the transaction documents. So we do need to have those PVR denominations recorded on the invoice, on the transaction document, and preferably on the dispatch record as well. So is that happening? Has everybody got those on there? Because if not, you'll get a non-conformance when I come around. The other one there is um, advertising material, just having some sort of note within your advertising material that it is protected by PVR, that it has protection rights on it. And the other big one at the bottom is um, not all transactions were actually forwarded through to Zespri. So we had to, uh, we noticed some we went through records. So I'm hoping that that new electronic system is making that a lot easier for you to, uh, to get that approval. So any questions or comments on that? Everyone happy? Okay, well, I'd like to invite up Julia to um, present on the KBC.
Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Julia Ansorch from Kiwi Fruit Breeding Centre up um, Number One Road. So before I start, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit more about me because I definitely haven't met many of you before. Um, I've worked at Plant and Food Research since 2014 um, in a range of different roles, sort of mostly as a technician and a research associate. And I was heavily involved in the breeding program, uh, mostly in kiwi fruit evaluation trials, but also some of the Zespri pre-commercial grower trials. Uh, last year, in, 2000, uh, in October, when Kiwi Fruit Breeding Centre kicked off, I transferred across and took on this new role as um, operations team leader, basically. So <clears throat> what I'm going to uh, cover off today is a little bit about how KBC came to be, and um, I'll sort of touch on what our vision is as a company and who, who we are, who our people are. Then I'll um, get into a little bit about breeding, nothing, nothing too heavy, just a, a surface touch, um, and sort of go through the new cultivar pipeline and the timeframes around that. And I'll finish off with um, a little glimpse at the future and sort of what's next for us. <clears throat> so Kiwi Fruit Breeding Centre, we are basically we're a joint entity between Plant and Food Research and Zespri. They, um, they have had a, a breeding program in place together for many years, um, a, a strong partnership, and their goal has sort of always been um, more, better, faster, new varieties of kiwi fruit. And they yeah, decided that if they come together and actually create this new venture that we could be really focused and hopefully achieve this goal faster. So we're still a relatively new company um, we were only formed last year, and um, at the time when we started, we were able to hit the ground running because uh, about 45 staff transferred across who, who were already doing this breeding work at Plant and Food. Um, and so we, we carried on doing our day jobs as part of this new company. And then sort of in around April this year, we had a permanent management team in place and then from then on, they were able to start working on um, developing our strategy and our vision and things like that. So this, that basically takes us to today, where they're just finalising these things. Um, and yeah, it's really starting to feel like its own company now. And throughout this whole time, we've still been able to keep doing um, the, the breeding and new cultivar development. So where we've landed in terms of a vision is, is this here, um, delivering the world's most irresistible healthy fruit for good. And that's the for good sort of ref, uh, can, can link at uh, sustainability, which is, is going to be one of our heavy focuses, but also for good of the people, the regions, um, and yeah, everything. <laughs> so... Uh, a bit about our people, we um, have a, a really good senior leadership team who are all uh, pretty much based in Tupuki. Matt Glenn, he's our CEO. And then the board, the KBC board that sits um, above us is chaired by Michael Ahi and then um, has representatives from both Plan and Food and Zespri who sit on, on the board there. So it's um, yeah, it's run really well, and we have sort of representation from our parent companies, basically. Now, onto the um, the the sort of teams themselves, we uh, have around about eight scientists or sort of program leaders, and obviously a few um, senior management team and support staff. But the ma vast majority of us are operations staff. So there's about 37 um, permanent staff and plus or minus 25 um, to help with the peak seasons. So where are we located? We, our headquarters is in Tupuki, um, but we do have orchards in Kirikiri, uh, Gisborne, Motueka and Clyde, and a few um, scientists in Auckland as well. Um, and since a couple of years ago, Plant and Food actually was able to kick this off together with Zespri that we have um, some, some research happening in Italy as well for, for the new varieties. 
So how does this all happen? Like, where do we, how do we make new varieties? Where do they come from? This is all possible because of our germplasm collection. That um, it's actually the largest collection outside of China. And um, it contains, as you can see from the picture, a huge range of genetic diversity. And I think there's about 54,000 um, plants in the program that can be used for breeding. So it's because of this collection that Plant and Food has been working on and now that KBC has access to that we can um, create new varieties. So I want to dive into the process a little bit. To some of you, this might be really obvious. You might be familiar with it, but I'll, I'll just whip through it. Um, to start with, we screen this collection of plants for the best potential parents in terms of what, what we're looking for in a new variety. And then we uh, cross the parents, essentially, by taking pollen from the male plant and putting it on a female flower. And then we let that uh, flower set fruit and harvest it um, at the appropriate time and plant, basically extract the seeds and plant them in a glass house. Uh, from there, we, we can use things called molecular markers to um, screen the seedling population and select the ones that we're looking for. So in particular, we can um, screen, are they male or female? And we're obviously typically mostly looking for female varieties. So we can narrow the pool of plants down quite quickly like that. Um, then we transfer the remaining seedlings to a nursery. And um, once they get a bit bigger, we plant them out um, in an orchard and monitor them and start to select ones with um, desired characteristics. So in particular, um, start looking at the fruit and whether they are desired by consumers. Um, we continue to screen the vines and, and also start to look at other traits like production. So what's the yield like? Um, what's the shape of the fruit? And obviously pest and disease resistance as well. Um, from there, we start to identify some promising selections and replicate them at multiple sites. So that's when I think we do grafting for the very first time um, to, to get them around our different orchards. And eventually we start to learn quite a bit of detail about each of the new cultivars, particularly around orchard management requirements um, or any post-harvest um, requirements as well. Then uh, this is getting quite close to commercialisation. We replicate and do more grafting out into the commercial orchards. And if the data there and the sort of studies um, show good results, then you end up with a new cultivar released to the market. So now I'll touch on some time frames. Um, as you guys know, kiwi fruit are slow growing and, and everything takes a long time. So um, we, we break it down into three stages um, and KBC is running stage one and stage two where obviously you do the crossing and have to let um, those fruit grow, other uh, plants grow and harvest the fruit. Um, and basically it can take a good five years to get into stage two. Um, from there, again, once it's grafted, you've, you've got to wait at least two years to get even enough data to make any decisions. So sort of looking at about nine years from when the cross was made until something is in stage three. Um, and then stage three, there's further evaluation and trials on commercial orchards, which, you know, another two, at least two to three years um, to, to establish if this cultivar could make it commercially. So we're looking at typically at least 12 years from the day the cross was made until something gets commercialised. So <clears throat> um, as, as a new company, we are definitely thinking, you know, can we be agile? Can we speed up this process? Or can we do anything differently um, to speed this up and, and have the new varieties faster? Uh, also, is there any technology that helps? Are there more molecular markers we can use to um, make decisions faster? Now, I just wanted to touch on what are the sort of drivers that um, help us make our decisions on, on all these new cultivars that we evaluate. 
Um, we, we tend to break it down into three key areas, um, anything on orchard and grower related, um, consumer and fruit related, and obviously supply chain as well. Um, but another element is that like, we're not just breeding for red, gold, green. It's Zespri has, has a whole, a much wider way of thinking and, and our product concepts that we're breeding towards constantly change. So we could even, you know, be breeding for something specifically um, that's going to be a health product or maybe a snack that someone buys or a breakfast food or a dessert fruit. So it's quite um, a range of different things that we could be targeting. Now I'll just um, cover a little bit about sort of our standard evaluations that we do once we have grafted plants, um, basically to help answer our questions within each of these pillars. Um, obviously for the grower we monitor things like bud break, flower timing and yield, um, among a few other traits. For consumers we do um, taste panels basically um, and collect data on flavour, texture, but also appearance. And for supply chain, we do um, storage trials and um, measure fruit firmness and disorders, and also uh, maturity development pre-harvest. So we are just one of three companies that basically have to work together really closely to produce new cultivars. Um, I'll, so plant and food research still have some involvement in managing the germplasm, um, but they also do a whole lot of fundamental science that feeds into what we do, and they um, manage the technology platform that we collect all our data into. So we have to yeah, have maintain a really good relationship with them. And then, as I mentioned earlier, KBC, we do a lot of the parental and the breeding and the different stages um, right through until pre-commercial trials, and that's when Zespri actually takes over again and recruits the growers to do these um, studies, and then they carry on with commercial optimization. Uh, in terms of the cultivar concepts that we work towards, they are initiated by Zespri as well, because they're the ones who know our, our customer and our client, you know, the kiwi fruit buyers, and so they develop they're basically a portfolio that feeds in to our cultivar concept. So it's a really um, interlinked system and we have to keep working together like that. Now, as you probably all know, the um, plant and food and Zespri have, have come up with new successful varieties in the past. Um, there's other three well-known ones. And the sort of latest latest new ones hot off the press are the greens that are, that are in stage three. So we heard that EPA put in a proposal to ban high cane, um, which meant we swiftly moved to identify the sort of top greens in our program at the time in late last year in about November. And um, since then we've promoted multiple greens to stage three and Zespri's recruited the growers to trial these for us. And there's sites located not just in Bay of Plenty, but in other regions around the country as well. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how these perform in a, a more commercial environment. Um, yeah, the, we've heard a lot from Zespri over the years that there's big things ahead. Um, they have plans to increase the demand for kiwi fruit fivefold, and they want to double the share of the um, of kiwi fruit in the global fruit bowl. So. We really hope that KBC can help contribute to this goal with new different varieties um, to broaden their sort of portfolio. Um, we're really lucky to build from an existing and successful platform. Um, we, you know, we're not starting from square one. And, and one of our goals is definitely to enhance industry commitment to innovation. Um, also, we haven't forgotten that we need to look globally and make sure that we understand our competitors and see if there's any commercial varieties out there that um, might, be, might be a competitor to, to Zespri. 
and um, yeah, we're just looking forward into the future. We're a growing business. We've been told there's a 50% increase of investment coming into KBC over the next decade. So um, big potential there to grow as a company. Um, at the moment, we're still quite small with the sort of 50, 60 staff, but that actually means um, that we can make, that the key decisions can be made quite close to the action by the key people involved in in the breeding decisions. Um, we also understand that new cultivars and new growing systems could disrupt the established models, so we sort of have to make sure we've got a finger in any any changes that might come up. Um, and yeah, I guess KBC plans to just make sure they've got a robust structure so that um, Zespri and Planet Food can continue to confidently invest. And that's all from me, thank you. <clears throat> oh, did anyone have any questions? Depends what stages you're referring to, but, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I just asked how many cultivars are currently under trial? I mean, stage one, the, the breeding level, they have thousands, and then stage two tends to narrow it down to about a few hundred. Thank you very much, Julia. I mean, I could listen to that sort of stuff for another hour or two. It's pretty interesting stuff, really. Um, I'd like to invite Tracy now to come and speak to us about licence release. Thank you, Dave. It feels very formal being up here underneath these spotlights. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't seem like a couple of years since I last spoke to um, all of you. Time flies. Uh, a lot has happened since then. And today I'm going to have a little bit of a chat about licence release. I'm going to talk about the 2022 um, release, which seems to be ancient history to me now because so much has happened since then, but I'm not sure how, um, what access that you've got to some of the results from that. Um, so both G3 and with RED. And then we will have a bit of a talk about the review that we're doing at the moment um, as well, and then the timeframes of when we're going to know what's happening in the future, which is probably your number one question today. And it's, believe me, it's all growers' number one question uh, at the moment of how much licence are we releasing next year. So I do have a, quite a few slides here, and I'm not going to go into them in detail. So... In 2022, you will know, so what this, this table here shows, the 2022 results on the left-hand side for the licence release, then you've got 2021 in the middle, and 2020. So we all know that we reduced our licensed area from 700 hectares down to 350, so I just want to talk to you a little bit about that first. And that was mainly driven by uh, all of our licence decisions, licence release decisions are driven by market demand. We had a little bit of a look at the model in which we do our projected yields. And for the last couple of years, growers have been saying, Zespri, you're, you're undercooking G3. We can do so much better with yields um, than that. Every grower is above average, right? There's no such thing as an average grower um, in the kiwi fruit industry. But when we actually went and had a look at the data for the last few years, those production, um, average production levels, as we're getting a more of a percentage of mature orchards, did seem like that we were undercooking the average yield. And I think we had it in at about 14,100 trays. Uh, so we updated that to about 16,300. And by doing that, what we saw is that the supply curve was coming just a bit uncomfortably close to the market demand curve. And as you know, we like to keep that gap between supply and demand because that's where our value lies, which we return back to New Zealand growers. So that in consideration with the issues that, we had go that we've got going on and still got going on with labour, 
Um, the, the market demand was the main driver, but we said, well, we also do have a bit of a capacity issue on shore, and so the light was pulled back to 350 hectares. Now, as a result of that, we still wanted to spread that licence as far as possible, and so we introduced quite a few restrictions to the licence process this year. Um, we, a couple of the rules were that um, you could, uh, the maximum you could bid on on your orchard was 50% of your plantable area, and there was a definition around plantable area. You had to state an orchard at the time when you bid, so we have got a lot of our growers that will just bid for licence, I'm going to bid for 10 hectares and I'll wait and see what I'm successful for and then I'll decide where I'm going to put it, or um, then I'll go and buy a property and as long as I've got it grafted in the two years. So we said you this year we said you can't do that, you have to have an orchard that you're going to apply your licence on and it has to be grafted there, you can't change your mind after the fact. Um, they were the two, uh, we also introduced an associated parties rule, so the maximum that any of your associated entities could bid was 10 hectares. So what we saw a result of that is that um, we dampened down demand quite a lot. Uh, and, and this was also in response to growers in the previous years going, it doesn't feel like it's an even playing field anymore, it feels like those bigger entities are getting all the licence. So you will see that we only actually had 343 hectares bid for, and that really surprised us. We had heaps of levers. We, in hindsight, we probably pulled too many of them. Um, we also did a survey after the event with growers and said, if you didn't bid for licence, why didn't you bid? There was way, a lot of talk and hype about how um, expensive the licence price was going to be because um, the area was constrained. And so we had a lot of growers say to us, look, I, I've given up, I didn't even bother bidding this year, which no doubt a few, quite a few of them are kicking themselves now. Um, so we only had 343 hectares bid for. We only allocated 324 hectares. That was quite a contentious decision um, and that was based on we looked at what some of those bid prices were right down at the lower end and um, we took into account what was commercially practicable and what is the value of similar licences that have been recently allocated. So there are about 19 hectares over 13 bidders that just didn't get allocated um, this year. We only allocated 324. Um, the average size, not, not unexpectedly, the average size was half of what it was last year, which is reflective of half the area. So we did see quite a nice longer spread, a wider spread uh, of licence this year. So we, we did achieve a bigger spread, which is a great outcome. So I know you guys are always interested in this. In the last couple of years, when I go back three or four years, we always had a 50-50 split between um, Hayward removal and new developments. And then in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of those um, corporate entities, investment syndicates come into the industry and buying up big parcels of licence. So we've seen that split go from 50-50 to more like 60-40, 70-30. Um, I think last year was about 65, 30, 65% new developments versus 35% Hayward cutover. So with the rules that we implied this year, we've landed back again at a 50-50 split between Hayward cutover and new developments. So what this is telling us is that in this year there was 162 hectares of Hayward taken out um, and there was 124 hectares of new developments. And then in 2023, there'll be 36 hectares of new developments. So that'll be those guys that have, um, are still getting their um, new developments underway. We did a little bit of an extra analysis this year, just based on previous feedback about an uneven playing field, and we wanted to understand the people that have bid for licence, how long have they been in the industry? Are these growers that have been in the industry for a really long time, or are they new entrants? And so you'll see from this here that it is pretty even. So starting on the left-hand side, you've got an entity that only joined the industry this year to ones that have been in for less than one year, then one to two years, and two to five years, et cetera. So we found that just under half of the licensed hectares were awarded to entities that have been established in the last five years. So it's not just people that have been in the industry for a long time, it is actually quite nicely spread. However, those new entities, about 70% of them have individuals in them that are already associated with other orchards, so they're not brand, brand new into the industry. Uh, what else have we got? 
So we also had a look at, well, who's, who's bidding? Is it, is it companies? Is it trusts? So what this shows us here is that 169 hectares out of 324 was bid on behalf of a company and 67 was a limited partnership. And then you go down, right down to the Māori Trust down there at three, three hectares. Remembering that a company isn't always um, isn't always a syndicate of investors. You know, there could be husband and wife that's joined a company and they own the orchard in a company name. And so we also had a look at it and said, well, before this, each bidder, how many, if you add up all of their orchards, if they've got multiple orchards, how many hectares do they actually have? How big of a grower are they? Um, and what is the success of the size of the grower? Because we're hearing from a lot of small growers going, we just can't compete with the, with the bigger guys. Again, it's pretty much even across the board. So you'll see on the left-hand side there, that first column, they're a brand new entity. So up until, the, up until this license round, they didn't own kiwi fruit at all. Um, then the next one is less than five hectares. And then as it goes along the right, it goes up to your, your bigger um, bidders. So again, it was pretty evenly spread. So that was gold. I'm going to move on to red now. So similarly with red, uh, we're originally going to do 500 hectares this year of red, and I'll go over the red plan in a, li in, um, in a minute. So the left-hand column is the 2022 results, middle column 2021, and the right-hand column 2020. So we put on offer 350 hectares. We didn't have the same restrictions with red as what we had with gold, with the exception of the associated parties. Because we were seeing last year that there were a lot of new entities of related people that were just creating different companies and trying to get around the maximum bid rule. So that associated parties was put in place. Um, I think it's fair to say that there was always, or also a little bit of nervousness around red. It was the first year that we were doing commercial, um, we were producing commercial varieties from the licenses that we allocated back in 2020. Um, and some of those people were having really um, variable results. And so there was only 287 hectares applied for. We only allocated 280 again, because there was seven hectares bid for from a couple of bidders at really, really low bid prices way, way low anything that we've allocated before. I'm quite happy to provide these tables um, also to you all afterwards. So conversion intentions for red, you'll see here that there is a lot more of the red went to new developers. Um, so 72% of the successful bids are for new developments and the majority of them being developed in 2022. There was only, what's that, 60, nearly just under 70 hectares it was Hayward cut over. And you can see the distribution there by region as well. So again, we had a look to say, okay, who's bidding for red? Um, once again, similar to, to gold, it's companies and limited partnerships that are taking up the majority of the licence. But again, that's not all um, external syndicate investors. That is existing growers as well that are setting up limited partnerships and have set up companies. A nice little contingent there on the end of um, Māori Trusts getting 21 hectares. So that's the 2022 results. I just want to talk a little bit now about licence review. So at the end of, um, actually at the end of 2021, with the, ex the increasing licence price, we were hearing really strongly from growers, like I said before, we feel like it's not like an even playing field anymore. Um, and, and so it's made us stop to go, okay, is the current release process, is that fit for purpose? Let's have a really good look at it and let's get some um, external experts in to come and have a look as well. Go and talk to growers and think about, is this for our future in terms of the remaining gold we want to release, but also any new varieties? How should, how's the best way to do that? 
So we, um, we did it in a couple of phases of work. We got Deloitte's involved to, do, um, to have a look at, from a grow, grower desirability aspect, how would you like to see, what are your current pain points with licence release and how would you like that to look in the future? So they held a heap of workshops, et cetera, and from those workshops, um, we ended up with a whole list of options and recommendations that we then have given to an independent economic consultancy firm called NERA, and what they did is they applied a viability and you know, feas feasibility lens over that grower desirability to find, try and find that sweet spot in the middle. So they've actually done that now, and we're just about to launch into a heap of what we're calling shed talks. So it's a different way of engaging with growers and getting their feedback on various issues, and license release is one of these issues. We're going around um, the country, and the locations of them will be in next this month's um, Kiwi Flyer. And so what came out of that process is that um, Nira said, hey, there's, some, there's heaps of things you can do here. Um, there's some stuff that is quite easy and simple to, to implement and simple for growers to understand because growers were telling us we don't like lots and lots of change. You know, This year you changed all of these rules at the last minute and we were confused and some of us didn't even bid because we didn't understand the rules. So we've got some quick wins there. And then we've got some more evolutionary and revolutionary changes that we could potentially make in the future. And some of them might actually apply to a whole new variety because they are quite disruptive and we've already released 9,000 hectares of gold. So we're going out to talk to growers about these and really focusing at the moment on the quick wins. And I'll go through what those things, what those things are, what we're having these conversations about. So there's five parts of the, of the license release system. So first of all, we talk about the amount of license to be released, which all you guys are really interested in. Um, and then how is the license actually allocated? How do we do it? You know, currently we do a closed tender bid um, and there's only one pool per, per cutover. And we put some rules on that around maximum bid areas and associated parties. Um, and that kind of is a segue into the next bit. What are the rules? Um, how do we, uh, this year we assigned a CAPE into it. Um, and then what are the mechanisms so what are the, how do we determine price? Because a lot of growers were saying to us, we just want, um, we want affordability, but not necessarily affordability and cheap license. We just want to actually have some different options of how to pay for it, and we want some certainty on price. We're quite happy to pay a high price, but we don't, at the moment, we don't actually know what that price is. It's a bit of a lottery. Um, and then some payment options. So at the moment, we, it's, it's an all upfront payment. They pay 25% when they're successful and they play the remaining 75% a couple of months later. And we've got some of our um, grower cohorts, such as um, Marty Freehold, um, uh, ownership going, well, we can't leverage our land and go to banks and leverage our land. Is there something else that you can do for us, Cespri, to help us out there? So, so what we're going to talk to growers about is um, we we'll look at the five-year plan so this is uh, this is the quite critical and critical to this conversation because license release mechanisms can be really dependent on how much license you're actually releasing. There's a big difference between releasing 300 hectares versus 1,000 hectares um, when we want to try and see as much as a spread as what we can. So that decision actually happens in October. Um, and I know that's a pain point for you guys because it's really hard for you to plan. The reason why it's in October is because the selling season is, is three quarters done. And so at that stage, we have another look at our predicted um, yields going forward. We look at the season that's gone. The markets go out and talk to their customers again to say, you know, next year and the year after and in five years' time, what would you be prepared to buy from us and at what price? So that's what we call a five-year plan. And that's when we decide decide what the following year's license hectares are. So what we are, um, what we're going out now is that we're, we're going to have a, a chat to growers to say, let's look at 2023 season and let's see whether we can address some of those pain points. And what would you think about having pools? So we've had actually, we've had pools before. We've had Hayward cutover pools versus an open pool. So the eligibility criteria is that you have to be removing, producing Hayward and it has, you have to have been supplying to Zespri for X amount of years to be, to be eligible for that pool. So we're having a conversation with growers to say, would this appease some of your um, some of your pain points. 
we're also going to review the rules um, as well. And when it comes to price, um, we're here all the time. It's just, it's such a lottery. And like I said before, there's so much uncertainty of, of whether we have bid the right price. And it's one chance that you've got a year. And if you, if you don't hit the mark, well, then you're out. So we're starting to have a discussion around um, where we would like to get to is that we're having an open tender, could have an open tender book build, which would be an electronic platform. Um, and so growers are able to see what bids um, at a particular at a particular particular price point, what bids are sitting there and what the demand for that is. So for example, if we decide we're going to release a thousand hectares and we say, how many hectares would you be prepared to buy at five hundred thousand dollars? And people may bid for in a total of 3,000 hectares, well, then we would lift the price up a little bit and say, okay, if it was now $600,000, how many hectares do you want? So quite, quite a change to how we do things now. Again, it would need to be a digital electronic platform, quite a bit of grower education to happen there. And so we're kind of going, well, what can we do? What's an option for the immediate future if we can't put that in place by 2023? And so we're having discussions with growers about continuing to do a closed tender bid. So it's still sealed, but everybody pays the clearing price. Whereas at the moment, everybody pays whatever price they bid. So you've got an equity issue of successful bidders all paying at different price points, which we've heard is a real um, pain point from growers. Then we're having a look at, well, is there some way that we can defer payment, either a pay-as-you-grow or pay-as-you-go? So pay-as-you-grow is similar to the model that we have in ZGS, where the growers up there don't actually pay for licence, they pay a higher commission for every tray of fruit that they supply to us. So there's a big raft of things that we're going out and have a discussion with growers about, um, which is in quite a con constrained time frame because come October, when the board decide how many hectares, we also need to go out to say to growers, this is how many hectares and this is how we're going to do it in 2023. But we're going to continue to have conversations about those more revolutionary um, ideas because some of them, you know, even the, the potential of leasing licences rather than buying them might be more appropriate for one of new, one of KBC's new greens instead. So I just mentioned that we're going to the board in October and then we'll go out and engage with um, industry after that. Does that come up okay? Oh, it's all skew with our fonts playing up with it, with um, our presentations. Now Dave said that you were interested in having a bit of an idea of what the plan is for red. So when we commercialised red and we looked at the market demand, and that was Asia, because we know that red um, won't survive a four-week transit to Europe, and so at the moment our target markets are Asia. We think that out to 2029, there is a demand for 15 million trays at sustainable um, orchard gate returns. And that's all in the, 2020, um, the 2021 and the 2022 um, Outlook documents and NVIG documents. So based on what we think this variety is capable of doing from a yield perspective, that equates to 1,500 hectares. We've currently only licensed 780. 2023 was supposed to be the last year of our license release for red. Um, we did 150, 350, then 500 and 500. But remember, we reduced the 500 down to 350, and then we only allocated 280. So we've still got 720 hectares to go. Um, are we going to do it all next year? No, I, I, we won't be. Um, that would be stupid to dump a heap of licence on the market. So uh, it, we will probably spread that out over two years, um, potentially equally. Again, that will be decided in October, but I cannot see the board going with releasing 720 hectares in 2023 when we only had demand for 280 this year. And that was about it for me, if there's any questions. There will be a oh. I'm You've given us information about RED, yes. um, and we can understand that uh, there might be half of three, no, 720. Yeah. You've, any idea as to um, some sort of guidance with gold. with gold at all? Um, 
I can only tell you what we've already gone out and published in last year's five-year outlook document and what we communicated with growers is that we, it'll be between 350 and 750 hectares. So what I can say, gold's a, a hard one. Um, anyone that's been to the road shows um, will see that the five-year outlook for gold and the market demand is still amazing. And Dan is telling growers that the market's are saying to him that within five years, we can have this demand for 1.33 times the amount of gold that we're currently supplying at the moment at one and a half times the value. So not only is there demand out there, but there's demand at value. And so he's saying, look, the markets want it. As much as we can possibly supply, we can sell at really good value for growers. The challenge is even though we've always been market demand focused when we look at licence release, we know from this year that there's some real pressures um, in terms of our, our onshore capacity to be able to deal with that growth. And that comes from a post-harvest perspective. That's labour. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this, all um, the media around quality. You know, you, our green growers and gold growers, depending on what variety, are, are looking at between $1.80 and $2.80 for quality claims this year. And the, that's a multitude of reasons, labour being one of them. Um, there's four or five reasons that we're investigating now for the cause behind that. So it'll be an interesting discussion for the board this year because they've got that com com uh, the competing factor of the market really, really want more volume and so we want to um, grow as quickly as possible, but we really have to be cognizant of how, from an onshore perspective, are we actually capable of delivering that? more questions? We're also going to look at timing. One more thing before I go. Um, a part of this licence release, we have growers saying the timing of your licence release, eh, it really sucks. Um, we're trying to harvest fruit and, you, and having to fill out these 15 pages of licence application forms. So we're having a look to see what that looks like. So there's two parts of timing. One is when we actually do the application process and do we move that after the harvest period, which I know works in the opposite to what you guys would like it to be brought forward. But we're also saying, we're having a look at, a grower said, give us, we want to be able to plan, we want planability, so let us know ahead of what your, what your intentions are, Zespri, because once upon a time we went, yep, yeah, we're going to do 700, 700, 700, 700, and the last couple of years we've said, we'll do between 350 and 750, um, just to give us that little bit of flexibility. So they're saying, we want, to be, we want you to be a little bit more definite than that, recognising that you've still got to do that annual review um, to actually confirm with the following year how many hectares. But we're looking at an option of, could we say, hypothetical um, figures, issue 500 hectares in 2023, and we say, well, for 2024, we will release 100 of the hectares that we're going to do in 2024. You can bid for that now. Because we've got growers saying, well, I want to have my licence, and my bank is telling me that I have to have my licence before they will lend me any money to buy a property. And so we're having a, a look at that as well, of, of releasing licence early, so they'll buy it next year, but they're not allowed to start grafting until 2024, and then they've got till 2026, they've got two years after that. So that's another option that we're putting in that will potentially help um, you guys a little bit better if we're promising or locking in licence um, 12 months ahead of time. Okay, how much do I go over, Dave? Sorry. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Tracy. I mean, this is the issue that I, on phone calls, it's always the same question. What, what's the licence going to be next year? What's going to be released? How many hectares? I don't think that made it a lot clearer, to be honest. <laughs> because it's still very uncertain. I think the whole licence release thing is just having to be revisited all the time, just to try and refine it to where the market is and what the capacity is, I think, was the big issue that um, came out this year with the post-harvest. So. I was hoping we'd have more definite for you today, but it's still pretty uncertain. Um, and as Tracy said, the red, possibly only two more years for licence release. 
Um, so something to factor in. The other thing as well is notice the smaller orders as well. You know, the smaller hectares that were bid for. So a lot of the orders coming through, it's a lot smaller. The average is a lot smaller this year than what it has been previously. Some of the big orders that have gone out have gone to people that bought licence last year and they were done them on contract. So it appears this year mostly a lot smaller. So if you've got any questions though around that, don't hesitate to fire them through and I can follow up with Tracy as we get more information. So I'd like to hand over to Rob now to talk about Budwood, all this amazing gold PSA free Budwood to get and, and the red. So over to you, Rob. Right, good day nursery team. Thanks for coming out today. I'm quite aware of the time. I know you guys have got far to travel, some of you. Right, so I'll get straight into it. Um, I'll just do a recap of the 2021 season. Last year we did 800,000 uh, buds of gold. Uh, this, this sounds low. Yeah, it is low. It was about half of what we needed because um, South Island got hailed on. So uh, we relied on um, some of the bigger growers to harvest their own budwood. Uh, which worked out superbly. The guys were quite understanding. Um, 1.1 million buds for R19. Uh, that's what we uh, procured last year with, with the males. Um, that went really well. That was supplied by 34 suppliers across the regions. Um, so um, it's... Um, as well as the the, the, the the budwood extension blocks. So these extension blocks I'll get into a little bit later. Um, you can see you can see in the slide there that's the beginning stages of our um, budwood extension blocks, and um, the idea behind that. Um, I'll get into in in, in other slides. So um, the season, just to recap, last year went really well as terms in terms of quality. Uh, one thing that was really highlighted for me was the fact that when we were grading out in the in the cool store, we had about a 50% a pack out that was received as medium that went into small. So there was a, there was a big issue there that we had to resolve. Um, so um, part of this these extensions, um, basically the the reason for those extension blocks was based on the 500 hectares release that we were going to do. Um, uh, which obviously was reduced at the time. Um, so with all this budwood coming in, um, it also highlighted the fact that it was no longer viable to do these spreadsheets and manual records to record all of this budwood. So we brought in a, um, some new technology uh, supplied by Radfords. Um, so we got to trial that last year. Worked really well. Linda was really happy with it, with the results. But during the season, we, we realized yeah, there were some, some um, enhancements that needed to be done in the system. Um, so some of those enhancements were um, bin location, uh, error sounds for misscanned sleeves. Um, uh, so basically, the system allows us to print, print labels and put them on, on the sleeves and book them in and out of the inventory. Um, so some of those improvements also included typing in the um, typing in the uh, K-pin instead of scrolling through, and you over-scroll over all the time. Uh, printing labels straight from the tablets, and uh, of course, incorporating our gap letters straight into the, um, into the system, which is great for me, because um, now it's just a push of a button, we can distribute all the gap letters, as opposed to how we did it last year, which was uh, t uh, exporting all the, the data, putting it into spreadsheets, um, messing around with it to, to put it into mail merge. Uh, this is just an example of some of the, um, the, the, um, the inventory's uh, updated specs at the moment. So we've got, uh, as you can see, bin location within, uh, um, within the cool store. Um, the, the functionality is vastly improved and, um, yeah, much more user-friendly. Um, you can see the, the figure on the bottom that I've included there is the distribution to date for our winter. So that's 1.4 million buds that we've sent out of the cool store. Um, yeah. Right, uh, 2022 recap. So yeah, uh, this year, you can see in the background there on the screen, that's an example of the, the canes being hailed on. Uh, wasn't a good look. Um, so 
that was that was quite uh, was quite important for us to assess that and and um, and um, hope that that doesn't happen again. Um, it actually happened. I think it was on Christmas Day or sometime in December. It was really random um, and unfortunate. But this year, yeah, we got away with it. So, and and the you know the canes really came back strong. Uh, we had some good quality stuff coming through this year. Um, so um, that with the uh, with with the um, with the good quality cane we had, we, that also allowed us to to um, procure some um, budwood for ex for the export market, which uh, which David took the lead on. Um, so with with all this uh, with all the budwood procurement, we also procured some bounty size. It all depends on. Um, you know, during the bidding process, um, what people are interested in. Um, they do indicate what sizing they're interest, interested in. So we get a bit of bounty in. Um, bounty, in my mind, you know, it's not practical to put it out in the orchards. Um, so that'll be forwarded onto the nurseries um, in, this, in the upcoming distribution, um, uh, which, will, the, which will open from November. Okay. You'll, you'll get some communication around that. Um, so I'd just like to go back to those extension blocks. So you can see the, the improvement, of, well, th that's a, a full canopy of strings of, um, of cane on an extension block there. So the idea behind that, it's a propagation block of, of budwood. Um, where we can go in, we can, we can harvest all of that cane. Instead of just taking the excess budwood that we would normally get to, to get to our, our, uh, our allocation, um, we, we can now take all of that, which, uh, which um, increases our numbers quite dramatically. Um, that'll also allow us, these are coming online now quite nicely as predicted. So for next season, we'll be able to reduce our suppliers and focus mostly on the quality coming in um, off, these, um, off these blocks and uh, focus on uh, profile sizing as well. Um, so, the numbers we've procured this season for 2022, um, 895,000 G3. That's based on the 350 hectares license release. Um, we, got, we brought in um, 1.3 million buds of R19. Um, even though we were undersubscribed, the, the carryover of uh, licensed guys who want, who, the guys who bid last year, 2021, indicated they wanted to graft in 2022. It was quite significant, so that brought our numbers back up again. Um, so one of the things we did this year was we allowed for four buds distribution on the red. Um, the reason behind that was because we didn't increase our numbers to 500 hectares release, we felt, well, let's offer the industry, cut over guys especially, uh, four buds of quality budwood that they can take for, for grafting and get them up and growing uh, full canopy faster. So. Yep, there was quite a big interest in that, um, and that, that's worked out pretty well for us. Uh, nursery, um, expression of interest. Yeah, thanks for your uh, input there, you guys. I've, I've got about eight submissions at the time of creating this. I got one more yesterday, I think. Um, that allows me a, a bit of a, to gauge the industry uh, requirements. Um, so some of you guys have, um, have received some already. Um, profile sizing, um, yeah, obviously it's based, when, when we procure the wood, it's based on the industry requirement for grafting. And um, so this year, we, we obviously, there was a lot of medium requirements, so it, it doesn't leave a lot of space for, uh, for small and bounty sizes, although we do procure that. Um, so what we do also do is, um, for the nurseries, we'll, we'll receive some bulk uh, material that's ungraded. Um, so, you know, that, that'll, that'll release at the, in the next distribution for guys to come and collect. Um, basically, that's, that's, uh, that's easily utilised by, by the nurseries. And, and I'll also make, uh, the, obviously, the, the excess leftover um, available to you guys that's bagged already. Um, right, so inventory for the end of the year this is what we're going to be this is what we have in stock going into the um, the summer now obviously this is prioritized to the the growers um, who are collecting budwood 
Um, a lot of guys have been put forward, put, the, put forward their, their, um, their season of grafting into the summer due to delays of various reasons. So a lot of that will go, go out. Um, but you can see there's, um, there's limited amount of small and bounty. Um, the guys are more interested in the medium, so that, that allows us to distribute a lot more of that small and bounty to you guys. Um, as far as packing sizes go, yeah, nothing's changed. We've still got the same packing sizes. Um, the varieties are still the same. We've still got the same male variety, um, the, the, the new, new G3 male pollinators. Uh, we do have quite a bit of MC79, ERP, as you guys know, um, in stock this year. I'm, I'm happy to distribute that out to you guys uh, once, our, once the, the bulk of our distribution is done at the end of the year. And uh, then lastly, getting back to the problem we had last year with our, um, with our grading, um, a lot of the medium wood went, fell over into small. It was a major issue, but um, you know, so it gave me, gave me a challenge to, to solve. And uh, so what I did was I created this little grading card, which we distributed to our suppliers. Um, and um, we also passed them out during our distribution to, to growers and their grafters, as well as our grading team. Um, yeah, I was really pleased with the result. Basically, the, the end result was that we achieved our split, our ratio, what we needed. Uh, it reduced the small significantly um, and left us with, with just the right ratio that we, that we required for, the, for this distribution. Um, yeah, and that's me for this season, done and dusted. Good stuff. All right, thank you. So are there any questions for any of the speakers um, before you take off? Anyone thought of anything else they'd like to ask? No? Okay, well that's us for the day. Thank you very much for your participation and coming along. It's um, Thank you very much, Julia. That was incredibly interesting, and that is the future of the Kiwifruit industry, really, with the KBC, and the future for the nurseries as well, really. This is going to be, I mean, there'll be a lot of cutover, of course, but there will be some new developments with those new varieties as well. So that was incredibly interesting. Keep up the good work and try and fast track it. <laughs> Thanks again. Travel safely home and uh, we'll be in touch over the next few months and try and get around to visit everybody and um, catch up again. Very good. Thanks again.